Welcome to Raising Consciousness with me, Lou Burrows, where raising human consciousness happens. On this show, I'm joined by guests to cover a range of topics and have conversations that will raise human consciousness for current and future generations. Now, let's dive into today's show. Hi everyone, welcome back to Raising Consciousness and today on the show I'm very uh, excited to welcome Amanda Holmes onto the show. Amanda, thank you so much for joining me here on Raising Consciousness. Such a pleasure to be here. Excellent, absolutely. Like, if it, I feel like it's been a long time because I think when I um, uh, spoke with some of your people, you know, and we were arranging this and things like back in the summer and obviously now it's like in October, so yeah, it's like a long time it's kind of uh, been coming. But um, yeah, I'm also happy that that, that you're here and uh, focusing on today's episode um, more on business and leadership um, obviously with yourself being a highly su- successful CEO so um, yeah we'd love for you to kind of share with the audience a little bit about who is Amanda and then we'll dive into to the meat of today's episode. Yes uh, wow well um, my company Chad Holmes International has assisted a quarter of a million businesses worldwide it was started by my father and he wrote one of the most adored sales books of all time. It's called Ultimate Sales Machine, which has 12 core competencies on doubling sales. He unfortunately passed. Um, it's been 10 years now. And I inherited the company uh, then at 24 with no prior experience. I was a singer songwriter before then and had to figure out how to manage a couple hundred staff. And here we are 10 years later, I've been CEO for the last eight. And when I first took it over, increased our leads by 1176%, doubled our coaching clients multiple years in a row. We're up over 300% this year. So uh, yeah, lot, lots of exciting things. Things are good by, by the sounds of it, which is um, very, very awesome. Uh, so kind of just touching on something you mentioned before. So at 24, when you um, got into this kind of crazy game of business, right? Um, was that an easy decision? To, uh, obviously, you inherited the company, but, but was that also easy decision to, to kind of make? Or did you still have? Um, I suppose what I'm trying to get at is like, you know, you're pursuing this other career, right? And then I'm having to shift to business. Like, was that a hard decision? And do you yeah, do you ever like think, oh, you know, what could have happened if I had pursued singing as well? Like, um, I'm kind of curious about that. Yeah, it was very hard. I wanted nothing to do with the business and I was very close with my father. So losing him was like losing air. Uh, And I really felt that if I stepped into the business, it would be like stepping into a grave next to him because he worked himself. He died at 55. It was way too young. So I, uh, yeah, a lot, a ton of resistance, but I study under an Indian saint. Her formal name is Sarvalokama, Her Holiness, Sri 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 1008 Guruji Punamji. I just call her Guruji. Uh, the name is very long in its significance. Um, and she was the one that just kept telling me that I should step in and that I could step in and that it would be best if I carried on my father's legacy. And so here we are today. Yeah, so like um, obviously having no um, business experience prior, like what were some of the first things that you realized that maybe needed to change in your own life or like from a mindset perspective or what were some of the things that you, you know, you kind of realized in the early days that beforehand with no experience um, kind of, you know, brought more awareness to it, more, more consciousness to it? Yeah, I um, I kept hiring and firing different C-suites. So I hired a couple of CEOs, a CTO, a CMO, uh, a CFO, just trying to fill that void that my father left behind. And um, one of my staff had said, you should come to Africa. I'm climbing Kilimanjaro. Uh, You'll have a great time. You should come. And I thought, wow, that sounds epic. I think I would love to. So I said yes on a Thursday. And by Monday, I was on a plane to Africa to climb the largest freestanding mountain. Uh, in the world. And it was on that climb that I realized that it felt insurmountable that I could reach the top of this because from day one, I had altitude sickness. So I felt terrible the entire way, uh, nauseous and headaches. And by the the last day, 
uh, I had two African men like practically carrying me. My eyes were rolling to the back of my head. A gentleman actually died the day that I summoned it. So it was rather, rather intense. Um, but what I learned from that whole experience was I was able to walk above the clouds in one of the most magnificent, you know, mountains in the world, all just one step at a time. And it's not like I was going to take over and know everything all at once in the business. It was just going to take one day at a time. And another thing that I realized is as much as I wanted to be my own and be strong and do it my, by myself, I literally wouldn't have been able to summit if it weren't for the people that supported me, like literally practically carried me uh, the last, well, not the for a, a decent amount of time, they were keeping me from falling off the mountain. So that was another realization for me that it's okay. I don't have to have all the answers. I don't have to carry this alone. Uh, I have a team. I have a bunch of people in the organization that can assist me and guide me. Uh, I just have to lean on them and put down my ego to say, I can do this all myself. I can't. And that's okay. Yeah, I think that's very, um, you know, important, you know, of, of us kind of allowing that uh, kind of separate our, separating ourselves from our ego and allowing us to you know, accept help or, you know, work with other people as well. And what's been the like single, single biggest lesson you've learned from having a team? I think you said like it was, it was over a hundred people, you know, it's like obviously you don't manage every single one i'm sure you have head of hr or, or other you know team in place to kind of uh obviously operate but yeah i'm just kind of wondering like the day-to-day -day life of running a, a huge company like that over the years i've done a lot to make the business mine and recognizing that i honor my father and everything that he built and we still teach his methodologies but the way that he operated was different from the way that i operated not that good or bad it's just different. I think he was uh, a bit more of a fighter and I'm a bit more of a lover. So the people that I started finding myself surrounded by were different than who he wanted to surround himself with. And um, so over the years, I've done a lot of changes to make uh, the culture different. Um, for instance, I, my business coach, so we do business coaching is one of the things we do. And so I'm a, I believe that you should be a product of the product. So if you have business coaches, you should have a business coach. So I do, uh, Jerry McNamara, who is brilliant. Um, and he has done a lot to help guide me around culture and core values. And some of my core values are like grace to, because grace can take you to places hustling never could and beauty to leave things, uh, to see beauty everywhere you go and to make things more beautiful as you leave, uh, which I don't think these kinds of words would have been used by my father necessarily, but they're my words. And uh, I have, yeah, really changed the group that are around me now. And it's, and I start first with is, is this person a culture fit? And if they are, then do they have the skill sets necessary to what, what we need to you know, be a rock star as a part of this team? So it's smaller than it once was, um, but more defined and uh, a very positive, uplifting culture, which feels how, good because yeah, I didn't yeah. inherit that. Kind of building on that, how important do you believe culture to be? I... I wouldn't have it any other way. So when I first took over, I had a lot of issues with, with staff, um, a lot of lawsuits. And I found very quickly that if there's money, people will attack. And whatever it takes, they will go to the lowest that they possibly can to grab and steal and manipulate. And um, after I you know, calmed the ship and got everything into a place of stability because it was quite volatile for several years. Um, I really had to take some time off. I spent a lot of time at Divine Bliss International, which is a nonprofit that my guru created because uh, I really just needed to, I had lost faith in humanity and 
uh, I thought that business was about backstabbing and cruelty and ego and, and manipulation. So I really didn't want anything to do with it. And it, and it took about two years of me listening to or talking to more plants than people <laughs> to kind of gain another love of, I had to heal. So um, that took some time. And then when I came back, I said, okay, you know, if, if I'm doing this, I can't have it any other way. So to me, culture is critical to the life that I want to live. Yeah, I guess that's amazing. So yeah, I've definitely um, been part of some, let's call them toxic workplace cultures, right? So I always love to have conversations with obviously people like yourself who is very conscious around creating that environment where people can ultimately thrive, right? And love to come to work and end the day feeling fulfilled, you know, um, safe, you know, to, to show up to work and be their authentic selves, et cetera, et cetera. And it definitely sounds like that's the culture that you're building, which which is amazing. In terms of like values, as you've mentioned, like grace and, and, and others, because of that more traditional association with business about being about hustle and kind of, you know, all of these stigmas, I guess, I find it fascinating, but also interested, you know, for you to kind of, I guess, open it up and kind of share more about this and like how you've still been able to grow the company, you know, and still be able to um, thrive, you know, ultimately with values such as grace, which historically, like you wouldn't put grace and business together, right? <laughs> so like, I'm, I'm curious like to, to like learn more about maybe like your, your mindset around that and like how you see it and, and how you incorporate that within your company yeah. as well, um, if that makes sense. Yes. Um, so when I first inherited the company, I had absolutely zero idea what I was doing, like so far from knowing the path or had any experience of it prior. And my guru was very big on, she, she helped guide me so much um, to learn discernment within myself, to go inward for answers, to collect information enough to make an educated decision. Um, but most importantly, uh, realizing that the true key to abundance, where, you know, you put your head down on the pillow at night and you feel success because it's, it's shining from within you out, um, that comes from giving. You know, the old adage that it's in giving that we receive. And so when I focus, instead of focusing on my own internal chatter or what am I doing or how can I achieve this, this or that, instead, my question is, please guide me to be a conduit of love and light so I can serve. And what can I do to best serve those around me, my clients, who would I like to serve? Who needs the assistance the most? Um, so it's questions like that that guide me in my day to day that I would think, you know, it's not about controlling or forcing the subject. It's about finding a flow and being willing to surrender to that flow to do the things that are for the best good rather than for my own personal interests, which is something I battle with every day, of course. But um, at least my intention is clear that that's what I'm working towards. You mentioned the word there, like surrendering, right? And allowing, allowing flow to kind of unfold and, you know, and also just like life as well. How do you balance that with uh, this kind of like being productive? You know, what, like whatever like being productive means, you know, like whether that's hitting sales targets or metric like whatever it is you know like yeah i'm gonna sort of throw that at you if that makes sense yeah so i'm very big on meditating um majority of people think that meditation is sitting still and quiet um but when you sit in silence a lot of the time your monkey mind just gets louder uh, my guru taught me that if you could use the sound of your own voice in some kind of repetitive flow it actually assists you to reach and attain meditation, which is actually an altered state of consciousness. So I will either sing or chant or play my guitar uh, for a certain period of time, and then I'll go into planning my day. So I need to take those moments. And even in between calls, I'll 
I'm within arm's distance of my guitar right now. This is my guitar. Uh, I'll pick it up and just start playing just to get out of my own head and get connected. So I'll do that, but then I'm still also a stickler for, you know, my, my father taught time management secrets of billionaires because he worked for a billionaire by the name of Charlie Munger and he doubled the sales of Charlie Munger's nine companies all within 12 to 15 months instead of, of them multiple years consecutively. And it's those six steps that can increase your productivity by 500% that I use um, every day. Uh, it's just, I make sure that I leave time to meditate throughout the day so that I can get back in alignment, but still very, as my father would say, pig-headed, disciplined, and determined to follow my time management. No, so I've uh, been taking like a program all about intuition. And one of the things that came up is around you mentioned it there so whether it's music or dance or just something to bring you back into the moment um so um yeah that um just kind of want to like throw that in there that resonates with something that i've kind of been implementing and doing and um just kind of like shifting the energy you know and come back in as i mentioned like into the into the present um which i think is is really important whether we're in business or not right <laughs> so yeah that's that's amazing uh in terms of of the book that you mentioned bef beforehand so um is so and you mentioned it beforehand like a lot of it can be still based on the methods that you or your father kind of Im implemented so kind of with that because it's like his methods and you are also changing or have changed the culture as, as well like is there a balance to that i'm kind of curious on the implementation of the methods and you know obviously what was taught in the book and obviously pe yeah. people can pick up the book and I'll link it down below. Um, yeah, I would love to share that with the, the audience. Yeah, so my father's strategies are timeless. That's why the book has still been referred over and over mm. and over again by people around the world um, for nearly 15 years. That's just pure word of mouth. People love it so much. So that speaks to the timelessness However, uh, he talked about the yellow pages and cold calling and faxing. And so it's just the tactics that have changed and adjusted. So uh, when I updated the ultimate sales machine, I had to um, put in some more, you know, recent uh, updated tactics like and not just talking about a radio, but I actually took my father's radio ads that have generated us tens of millions of dollars. Uh, I repurposed them and put them on Facebook ads just to prove that the message can stand the test of time. And it did, it actually uh, decreased my um, cost for ads um, by 30% using his, his radio ad that was 20 years old. So, um, yeah, strategies, timeless, just the tactics that have changed is, is how I've adjusted. Well, how he used to get through the gatekeeper on a cold call, I'm now teaching on Instagram DMs and LinkedIn messages. So, And is there, I'm sure all of the lessons within the book are very important, you know, and um, as important as each other, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. But for you, like, is there one that stands out? a bit more than, than, than the others or not really like there are a ton of nuggets in there uh you haven't read the book right no i haven't no I, i'm, I no, I'm curious i i could tell because every single page is literally mm. gold of like people get the audio and they go oh my god i need to get the book because i can't just mm. listen to this i have to take notes and i can't tell you how many people have shown me just <laughs> they just stopped highlighting because they highlighted every <laughs> every paragraph. So um, there's so much in there, right? Like I said, time management secrets of billionaires is the first chapter. Chapter four is a critical one because you could be, let's say you want to double your sales. And right now you're using LinkedIn messages and you're sending a certain amount of LinkedIn messages a day or a month. And you're thinking, wow, all I have to do is double the amount of messages I send and maybe I can double my sales. But what we teach is you can actually get nine times more from what you're already doing to generate new clients if you just adjust 
the messaging that you're going out to the marketplace with. And we, we prove this with a diagram called the buyer's pyramid. It's rather fascinating. Um, we have how to hire sales superstars without on pure commission, on pure commission. My father was pretty well known for that one as well. Um, we also have my father invented. Have you ever heard of the dream 100? I haven't. No. Oh, okay. It's um, the fastest, least expensive way to double sales. Uh, it's basically, there's always a smaller number of better buyers than there are all buyers. So marketing and selling to them is cheaper than marketing and selling to all buyers. So leading an intensive Dream 100 effort just to those targeted clients that will spend way more with you uh, is critical today, especially since we're in this shiny object syndrome world where we think we have to go after thousands of clients to close a few. When if you just focused on those few, it would make all the difference. So there's a lot that's there and, and uh, on the business side and then on the more personal side, uh, the way that I learned my father's business was by reading through his old emails. Uh, that was the only way I knew how he felt about people and the organization or what he wanted. And I found this email where he said that he generated more wealth in six months than the prior eight years combined. And it was because of this one thing. And I took that and I put it in the final chapter, and I called it the encore my father never got to give on how to live a rich and full life. So that's also in the book. Amazing. Awesome. So I'm definitely going to get it book myself and, and link it down below because it sounds, um, sounds fascinating. In terms of uh, running a business, and it kind of links to what we talk about in terms of uh, the book and sales as well. What part do you enjoy the most? Like, Do you love the sales process? Do you love the sales or do you prefer more of like the HR and people side, as we were talking about before and setting the tone of the culture, et cetera, or is it more operations for you? And um, yeah, um, or, or is there a part like you love the most, but your skill sets are more tied to one area? I'm, I'm curious to break that down. I love to innovate. I love finding something that's difficult or a challenge and being able to solve it. That's very exciting for me. Uh, after I finished the book, then I went through our products and services and I reimagined them. Uh, my team says that I innovated what normally would take a company five years. I did this last year. So it's, it's been a lot, but, um, it's been really exciting to see the actual results. So I'm very big on market data and just data in general. Uh, I like to quantify and qualify uh, to make sure that things are working. So, for instance, um, the average person that buys a course online, 96% of them will never finish it. 96%. It's only 4% that will actually complete it, which is really sad. So I started running these boot camps where it would be interactive, live, live you know, over the internet and I would bring a bunch of companies together and they would all go through the process and the, um, the teachings together. So in a month's time, 42% um, of the people that went through the boot camp generated leads and 32% generated sales, which a lot of my clientele have a much longer sales cycle than just a month. So even just having a third of it was really impressive for just 30 days. But if we look at the industry standard, right, it's 4% just completing. That's not even counting people that are actually getting results. I'm tracking results and we're getting 10x industry standards. So I'm that really thrills me to actually see. I'm not about, you know, just talking to talk. I want to actually see that people are getting the results. They're benefiting from it and they're able to um, grow and achieve the dreams and goals that they're looking to achieve. So that, that I think is my most exciting thing is seeing, seeing the organizations that we've been able to touch. That's amazing. And these uh, organizations that come to you, like what is their, uh, well, like what type of organizations are they? Like what, uh, what's their biggest challenge? Like, is there a trend you're noticing? Uh, I'm always like fascinated by, by trends and stuff. <laughs> Yeah. So since we've assisted a quarter of a million businesses worldwide, it's really across the, the board. Um, I mean, I have everything from like high end door handles out of India to uh, pop up 
biohazard labs in third world countries to uh, SaaS companies, to manufacturing companies, to financial services companies. Right now, every time a trend is happening in the industry, if, if one industry is taking a hit or it's going through a lot of change, typically they'll start coming to us in volume, which is fascinating to watch. So right now, I've gotten more real estate companies to ask me to keynote in the last 90 days than I have in the last like six years. So because of the interest rates rising and, and so much uh, uncertainty around, is this 2008 happening all over again? Is that where we're headed? Uh, a lot of real estate companies have been knocking, but um, they all pretty much share a similar desire to want to generate more leads and double their sales. That's usually pretty typical. Yeah, I mean, um, if there's uh, a startup entrepreneur or you know, somebody who is in the situation that you're in back at the age of 24, what would be like for everything you've you've gone through, you know, starting or knowing nothing about entrepreneurship or business to where you are today, um, what would be some words of wisdom or some inspiration that you would share with them? Yeah, I would say be honest. If you don't know the answer, that's okay. Um, ask a ton of questions because you're not, ex it's okay that you don't know. People will respect you more if you ask the right questions rather than just trying to have the bravado, like I know what I'm doing. Um, I, I saw that more people gave me more respect the more questions I asked because it showed that I did have a propensity to understand what was happening. And uh, I was asking the right questions and good questions. So it's, if you're trying to impress somebody, it doesn't always have to be with the way that you answer a question. It could just be the question. So yeah, like um, be curious. Like I'm kind of getting from that, interesting. And so in terms of like asking the right question, right? Like if, if somebody's like, well, what's the right question, Miranda? You know, I, I don't know. You know, um, do you have like maybe an example or? Um, so when I first took over the business, we were running radio ads mostly that was generating our leads and the leads were drying up and nobody really knew what to do. Um, we were still running my father's voice in ads for seven months after he passed. It was really embarrassing because we didn't, nobody on the team knew what to do. We hadn't innovated. He was the innovator in the company. So when I would get on those calls and I finally got up the courage to actually start talking, I was just asking questions that were very clear to understand where are we at right now? Because when people get into panic, they don't think logically. And I was just logically trying to understand what was our cost per lead, you know, six months ago, a year ago, what's our cost per lead now? How much are we spending? Are we making an ROI? Uh, when do we break even? Um, what are our conversion rates? Uh, where are we losing conversions amidst each step, right? So it's just dissecting and um, getting clear that you're trying to optimize your business, right? So it, it, I guess I really like that because I used to be a singer songwriter and that was very subjective. Anybody could say either I like your song or I don't. And there was no real quantitative data that could say if you've done well or not. So I, I feel that I took that creative part of me and applied it to business so I can still from the same place that I would write a song, I now write a marketing or sales campaign but now the validation is, okay, what were my conversion rates before? Have they improved? What's industry standard? Am I higher than industry standard? What was my goal? Did I achieve it, right? So all of these steps that data will help assist you to quantify and qualify is critical. And majority of business owners don't do that. And they walk away from a great idea before it's come to fru full fruition because of either lack of focus or they're just not looking at the numbers. 
And why do you think that is? Like, do you think, yeah, like, is that fear? Is that like we don't have the systems in place to track everything? Um, I'm yeah. sure there's a, there's like many different reasons depending on, diff, you know, but yeah, I'm just kind of curious, but from your experience, what, like, what are some of the top reasons? I would to love to know why more business owners would have more dashboards and more systems to track. It boggles my mind how many don't. Um, there's so many tools today to make that really easy and simple. Um, so that's always kind of boggled my head, but it's very common. I, I'm not exactly sure why, but very common. I Maybe also because 92% of companies don't have a sales process. So how are they going to track a process that they haven't put anything in place, right? They're just winging it. And when you think about salespeople, only 0.08% of colleges in the United States offer sales as a major. So where are they learning sales? Where are they learning how to conduct sales? Majority of them aren't, so they don't know any better, um, whereas every step of the way should be tracked and measured. So probably because they don't have a roadmap for from cradle to grave or from start to from cold lead to closed business. Um, so if you don't have a defined process, then how, how would you be able to track it? So I think it starts there. Yeah, that makes sense. I don't know. Awesome. Um, well, in the time that we have left, uh, do you have any final thoughts that you would like to share with our audience today? Anything? Just anything yeah. in general? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anything that comes to mind, anything that you're inspired maybe to share? Um, yeah. I, I think it's critical to recognize that each person is individual of their own and we all have a different way to express ourselves to think to act our choices are our own uh, even though the world tries to tell you this is what you should do this is how you should act this is who your friends or your family believe you to be um, however uh, a lot of entrepreneurs at least experience this where they go beyond that because they're interested in growth and development and there's many people that will try to stop you from uh, growing or changing um, or evolving. So I would just um, say, you know, be committed with pig-headed discipline and determination to be the best version of you. Uh, and that will look different than everybody else. And that's okay. So you can't pick it up on that. Um, has that happened to you? Absolutely. Hmm. Yeah. So from my experience, um, I, you know, I feel like, so was that more uh, like, was it like school or just like in life in general? Because I, I think like having, um, so for, from my experience, uh, obviously a lot of um, entrepreneurs that I kind of talk to, et cetera, it might be like their friends or, you know, their, their, their family, et cetera. And I always find it interesting when people who I talk to have entrepreneurial parents and, and if that makes a difference, if that makes sense. So from your experience, like, did that, did that help or? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. A huge amount. Yeah. Growing up, it was always, you know, if I wanted to do a lemonade stand, my father would come out and change my sign from lemonade to best lemonade in the world. Mm. You know, or if yeah. I was running for student body, uh, he taught me tricks on how to go up on stage in front of the school and how to win them over, throwing candy out, you know, getting their attention because what do kids want? Candy. Um, when I started my business or when I built my first website and how he guided me to make sure that the number one thing that your website should do is collect emails. That is the first mm -hmm. step so that you can continue to market to them. So what can you provide that's of value? So these these helpful hints he helped um, he helped me with along the way. So I would say that it definitely changed my perception of business. And so, in terms of like when you're growing up with friends, etc., were they like? So for me, like no one knows why I do podcasting, right? Like you can just you know go and do something normal, right? So I'm just wondering, like from your experience, um, if they were supportive or you know, not, you know, um, and how you kind of manage that? Not always, no. Mm. Uh, some more than others. 
And um, I think also it's critical who you surround yourself with is also a pretty important thing. So um, entrepreneurs are usually pretty lonely and it gets lonely at the top for sure. So uh, it's critical to find other people that are like-minded. Um, and, you know, so many different ways to find community today, whether it be online or in a mastermind or in a meetup group or wherever it may be. But I, uh, I highly recommend uh, elevating who you surround yourself with because that'll help. Yeah, I definitely agree. Well, Amanda, thank you so much for coming on to Raising conscious Consciousness today. It's been it. a pleasure. I've learned a thing or two, which is always great. Um, so before I let you go and crack on with your day, where can people learn more about you, connect with you, learn more about the company, yes. um, the book? Yeah, um, feel free to, to share where people can yes. go. Yes, if uh, people would like to know what's holding them back from doubling their sales, you could go to howtodoublesales.com. It's just five quick questions and then we give you free trainings on what you can do to double your sales the fastest. That's a great tool. That's how to double sales.com. If you heard everything and said, wow, I'd like to see the new edition of ultimate sales machine. You could go to ultimate sales machine.com and get that book. Um, and then I spend, I'm on all the social medias, but I spend more of my time on Instagram. So you can find me at Amandita Holmes, because Amanda Holmes is taken. So it's my salsa mm. name, Amandita Holmes. <laughs> Amazing. Awesome. Well, I will link that all down below in the show notes um, so people can easily find can find all of those. But um, yeah, thank you once again for coming on to the show today. It's been a pleasure. Same here. Excellent. Well, guys, I will be back next week with another guest, another episode of Raising Consciousness. So I look forward to seeing you all and talking to you all then. Have a great week, guys. If you got value from this episode, found it insightful or learned a thing or two, please leave a review where you can let everyone know that this show is worth checking out. I appreciate you so much. You'll be hearing from me in the next episode.